Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Andrew Stott, I'm the Emperor of Stemeria, and today I want to talk about the past, present and future of the Imperial Treasury. So I've not really prepared anything for this, uh, I'm just going to sort of ramble on, there's going to be lots of tangents, lots of side stories, but you know, stick with me and we'll get through this together. <clears throat> so first things first, the Imperial Treasury, as a lot of our supporters will know, especially the ones that have been following us since the beginning, it was initially just silver. And the purpose of the Imperial Treasury when we first set it up was very different from what it is now. So when we first set it up, as our supporters will know, we are a big, uh, we're big advocates for the accumulation and use of gold and silver as a form of sound money. So that is to say, we, we oppose currency, fiat currency, especially micronational fiat currency. We consider it worthless. We believe in money with an intrinsic value to it. So gold and silver being the optimum forms of money. And we uh, purchased silver initially to use to reward our supporters and to trade with other micronations and that was its entire purpose. It wasn't about uh, using the imperial treasury to make money, it was about just uh, using gold and silver, at the time purely silver, to highlight the importance of accumulating and using sound money. It was more of an educational tool as much as anything to ensure that people understood that the you know the, the pound the dollar the euro whatever else it may be they were all intrinsically worthless and this is what we did from our foundation in june 2019 to december 2019 so it was primarily silver in well, solely silver then we added a little bit of gold and then by the end of 2019 we sort of changed things up a little bit so because we imported our silver from mainland europe the reason being that um, in the UK, unlike a lot of parts of the world, in the UK, silver, when you buy it, you have VAT on top of that. So you pay an extra 20%, give or take, along with other taxes and fees. If you buy it from the European mainland, then even though that a lot of the silver that we bought from the European mainland started off in the Royal Mint, they saw... <laughs> We had, we had to import it from the European mainland to avoid paying VAT. It was a bit of a weird system that they had going. Um, but when Brexit happened, the frictionless trade between the mainland, uh, mainland Europe and the UK, uh, obviously didn't exist anymore. So VAT would now be applicable even on the silver that we imported from the European mainland to the UK. And so it just made silver completely uneconomical to sort of continue purchasing and using. And so I made a conscious decision to sell the silver and go, right, okay, instead we're just gonna go gold. So we went 100% gold. Same principle, still sound money. It's a lot harder to trade in small denominations, but you know, the, the principle was there and the, you know, the, the rationale was still there. And so we uh, started to accumulate gold in December, and sort of January time, January, February, and then obviously come 2020 in March, you know, the, the global pandemic really started to kick off. It started to you know, tank the stock market and all the rest of it. 
And it was around this time that we sort of considered how we might develop a micronational economy, how we might sort of utilize the resources that we had. And it was around this time that we really started to pick up on the idea of state capitalism. So the idea of state capitalism is something similar to Norway. You have a free market economy, but the state plays an active role in that economy. So in Norway's case, for example, the government has a, a big stake in their oil industry and they use the profits from that oil industry to buy shares in the stock market. And then they use the dividend payments and the profits they make from the shares to um, fund certain services. I think I've got that right. I mean, do your own research, but I'm sure that's the basic principle is there. And so I thought we could do something similar. And so with the stock market crashing, uh, I thought it would be a good opportunity to purchase stocks relatively cheaply, uh, some with high dividend yields, some with just potential to grow in the future, you know, as and when in the years to come, the uh, global economy recovered. So we thought, OK, so we've got gold and now we're going to start buying shares in the stock market. So we bought our first shares in sort of March, April time. And uh, yeah, that was we only put in a few thousand pounds initially. I think it was five thousand in total initially. It wasn't supposed to be something big or grand. It was just a, a way to make a small amount of money on the side while the majority of our funds were still allocated to gold for the purposes of accumulating use and sound money, trading with other micronations, rewarding our supporters, educating people about the concept of sound money. And then I thought a bit more about it, and uh, I personally had been trading in digital assets like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and a dozen other cryptocurrencies for years, even before Stemeria. And I thought, well, maybe we could expose ourselves to uh, a small amount of um, digital assets. So in May, we started to buy a tiny amount of Bitcoin, Ethereum and Litecoin. And by this point, things are getting a little bit messy in that it's no longer just about accumulating and using gold. It's about how we can make money, you know, how we can ge keep generating money and generating an income um, to, to keep funding the project and the little side projects that we have going within Stemeria. And uh, yeah, over time, so between sort of March, April 2020 to the end of 2020, so December 2020, um, we accumulated increasingly large amounts of shares in the stock market and a large amount of digital assets to the point where it was dwarfing um, the amount of money we had in gold, uh, the amount of funds we had in gold, I should say. So at this point, I should stress that the Imperial Treasury, it was funded virtually entirely by the Imperial family. That is to say, me and my wife. And uh, the, so when we first started up, we put aside a few thousand pounds, um, bought some silver, and that's how it all started off. And then eventually we allocated more funds to the project. So we purchased more gold, more shares, digital assets. They were all purchased um, through us. Uh, our supporters, citizens, patrons, and just people who find us interesting can and have contributed financially. Um, but these funds, are, yeah, I think it's less than £150 off the top of my head, and it's allocated to a segregated bank account, which has not been used um, and will eventually be used to sort of cover the costs of the website or the merchandise that we buy out of our own pocket and then distribute to our supporters, just help to cover those costs. It's not intended to use um, for investing and trading um, in the Imperial Treasury as, as it is now. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that was that was clear before we sort of carry, out this, carry this video on. And I'd also like to say that as a micronation, one of our objectives is to reduce reliance on and contributions to the UK government. And so the funds that we allocated to the Imperial Treasury were done in a way that accomplished this. So for example, the uh, silver and then the gold that we accumulated uh, initially were in the form of Britannias. They're considered legal tender in the UK, and so they're free of capital gains tax when we sell or otherwise dispose of them. Um, we now have gold sovereigns, and they're also considered legal tender in the UK, so they are also free from capital gains tax. Uh, the stocks and shares that we bought, they were done through a uh, stocks and shares ISA. So all the dividends, all the profits we make from selling the shares, <clears throat> they're all um, completely free of tax as well. Don't have to pay any taxes on those. 
And uh, yeah, the contributions that our supporters make, they're done through um, GoFundMe and they're considered gifts or donations. So again, they are also free from tax. Uh, the only tax we do have to pay is the tax, uh, is the um, is the money that we make from selling our digital assets um, because they're not purchased through an ISA or anything fancy. They're just, you know, they're assets that we have to pay tax on when we sell them. But everything else we've done in the most sort of a self-reliant way um, possible. So just going forward, that's something worth thinking about. Now, coming towards the end of 2020, the digital assets that we purchased, which you know, numbered nearly a dozen at that point, they were increasing in value at a far faster pace than either the, the gold, the silver, or the shares in the stock market. Um, and it peaked for us in January 2021. The, I mean, they were rising astronomically quickly. And so we took the decision to sell most of them at that point, um, and pull those funds out of the Imperial Treasury to and set aside for the purchase of property and land later on in the year. And uh, at that point, we had to really reevaluate what exactly we were trying to do, because it became clear that the, the safest way, and, and this was the long-term investment strategy that we sort of came up with, the, the safest, most cautious approach at this point would be to hold a sizable amount of shares in the stock market, not all, but a sizable share, and then use the dividends and the profits we made from selling those shares, uh, allocated them to purchasing gold and uh, Bitcoin, just Bitcoin, no other digital assets, solely Bitcoin. Um, and that was, uh, that was a strategy that I thought about quite a lot. Um, purely because it, it it diversified our portfolio, you know, nothing would be heavily invested in one area or another. But the more I thought about it, the less inclined I was to go down that route, purely because what I want to see is large returns in a short amount of time as possible. So the problem is if investing heavily in shares or in gold I'm not like we're not likely to lose out on that, but if we allocated those funds to digital assets, for example, the potential there is that we could, you know, three, four, five hundred percent by the end of the year, or you know, in a few years' time. It's definitely on the cards. That's not going to be the case for shares in the stock market. It's not going to be the case for gold and silver. And if it is, then we're going to be in some serious trouble. Um, but the because the uh, crypto space is so new, it's so young, there's, you know, comparatively there's not a lot of money invested in it, but it's continually becoming more and more popular and more and more mainstream. It's definitely an opportunity to make some uh, serious gains um, for the project. And going forward, I've sort of come around to the idea of trying to move towards becoming a more full-time micronational leader, a more full-time micronationalist, uh, with the potential for getting citizens of Stimeria who um, perform uh, certain roles within the project, perhaps we could get them involved either part-time or full-time, you know, to be able to support them financially uh, for their services. And I, I quite like the idea of moving us in that direction. But the problem is the investment strategy that we came up with earlier this year wasn't going to be able to accomplish that. It might make a few thousand pounds a year, might you know, even five, ten thousand pounds a year as an incredibly optimistic figure, but that was never going to be enough. So what I've done instead is I've taken the decision to, uh, you know, I've done my due diligence, I've done my research, and we're gonna, we're, I'm, I'm going to put the funds that we have left, about a little over £40,000. We're going to allocate that to a very particular digital asset um, called uh, ADA, um, or it's more popularly called uh, Cardano. And this is a proof of stake 
uh, digital asset as, a as opposed to a proof of work digital asset like Bitcoin. And what this means is that by simply holding uh, Cardano, we are paid monthly rewards. We are paid, um, I suppose, in effect, dividend payments. And at the moment, that's, you know, it, it's it, it's fine. It's, it's, you know, four or five percent, I think. But the the point is that if Cardano increases in value, which is expected to do in the next few years, say it goes five, six hundred percent, that four percent yield then becomes substantially more. So, you know, with every 100 percent gain, it virtually doubles in value. And so the idea is we're going to take uh, a, a calculated risk or a punt, if you like. We're going to allocate almost all of the funds uh, we have left, uh, you know, the, the, a little over £40,000, excluding the about £7,500 worth of gold, I think, that we have left. Um, we're we're going to keep that as is, and then we're going to take the £40,000 or so that we have in cash. That's going to be allocated to Cardano. And so we're going to be a, a micronation that's effectively funded uh, by the um, staking rewards, the, you know, to, to most people, basically the dividend payments um, from Cardano. Uh, so, you know, this might go completely the wrong way. It might not work out at all. But the upside potential is extraordinary. And, you know, if it does pan out the way we hope it pans out, the way I hope it pans out, then we could be looking in a few years time at being able to purchase, you know, entire, you know, hundreds of acres and properties and be able to take on, uh, you know, full time or part time um, staff, citizens of Stamaria to be able to, to work for the project in various capacities and various roles. I mean, it could really bring the project to the, the next level. Um, and in the meantime, we will still be looking at acquiring smaller plots of land with the funds that we've taken out of the Imperial Treasury beforehand. Um, there, there are one or two plots we're keeping an eye on at the moment um, and a video for another time, but I'll, I'll keep our supporters updated on, on that one. But yeah, this is the this the, the calculated risk that I feel is necessary in order to be able to push Samaria to the next level in as short a time as possible. Um, so, you know, if you have any sort of questions or queries, um, if I can answer them, I will. Um, obviously, you know, this isn't going to be a popular decision with everyone. But at the end of the day, all the funds that we've allocated to the project, they have been from my wife and I. You know, the risk is entirely on us in that regard. You know, the, the money that people have contributed hasn't gone towards this decision. Still sat in a, in a segregated bank account. So, you know, if it if it goes horribly, horribly wrong. That's on me. That's on us. Um, but, you know, it wouldn't be the end of the world. So, yes, that, that, that is the decision that I've made and hopefully it'll pan out. But I'm interested to know what your thoughts are on it. Maybe I've made a horrendous decision. Maybe I've, uh, you know, cracked the code and we're going to be, uh, we're going to be able to go forward at a far faster rate. Let me know in the comments below what you think. Um, and if you enjoyed the video, if you've made it this far, feel free to give it a like, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and I'll catch you in the next one.